I'm tired of getting picked on. I'm tired of having to take these damn train tracks halfway around town to get home. My name is Michael Cook. My film is called Across the Tracks. It's a short film. It follows two young African-American sisters who are growing up in the late 60s, and the youngest one is fair-skinned, so she tries to pass as white. We're trying to educate people in the very notion that this is a story that happened. It's fact based in fiction. This story is not based on anyone in particular, and then again, it's based on anyone in particular who had to deal with this during that time. So we're really just trying to show people a different type of story that took place during that time. And we follow them as young girls growing up in the late 60s in the Deep South, and 40 years later as older women to see how their relationship maintained. This is Tara Hines. Come on, Tom. 40 years is a long time to hold a grudge. Now, I've known y'all had your differences, and it ain't my place to speak on it. But can't you be sisters for two days? As an independent filmmaker, I wear many hats. Primarily, it's directing. I have, uh, I have disciplines in like almost every field. I guess as an independent filmmaker, really, you ask anyone, you, you kind of kind of look up into the sky because you do so many things on your independent projects. On paper, yes, you're a director most times or a writer or someone involved in the creative process, but when it comes down to actually getting your job done, you're, you, you would do almost any position just to make sure that it happened. So on Across the Tracks, I was the director, I was the cinematographer, I was the editor, I was the producer, I was the accountant, I jump-started cars because that was that's what was needed for that production. I, I did a lot of things. Mike and I, we've been in this from the beginning. Like, I honestly, I would have never thought to do this because we didn't have enough money to do something like this. I think if he didn't have all the skills that he had and like our, our skills combined, we joked at the beginning that even if no one else signed on, we'd still make the film. We'd still find a way to make the film just because we could take it from beginning to end. It was an amalgamation of a lot of things that Kim and I really wanted to get across. Like the town itself, Arlington, Georgia, my grandparents grew up in that town. And since a little kid, I've always, always, always wanted to shoot something in that town. It was very small, out of the way, very nice people, one stoplight. And just from growing up there and spending so much time, I was like, I, I want to shoot something in these fields, in this town. I just don't, I don't know what. Then the story kind of crafted itself and kind of lent itself to it's like, okay, if we're going to write something, going back to an independent film process, it's like, you know, you, you write to your strengths. You don't have a lot of money, unless your last name is Rockefeller or Scorsese. No one's going to come in and just like magically give you things. So you, you have to do your creative, you have to do your creative justice and realistically say like, all right, me, myself now, with the resources that I have, what could I shoot? What could I film? What story could I tell? And give it a re give it a good chance of not looking like garbage. When writing with someone, a good writing relationship, I feel like you you can't really pull apart what's yours and what's theirs. At least that's the way it is for me and Kim. Like we came into this project and we both had a lot of things we wanted to get out. I think all good partnerships, they just kind of mixed and meshed and became one because I feel if you could tell a, a, a delineation between two things, it would kind of ruin the film. You know, we had so many ideas for this one. We wanted to get an aerial shot. You know, we wanted to make it 10 times longer than it was. But again, when it came to the day, it's like, all right, this is what we can do very well and still have the story intact. So the town was a big part of why we wrote where we wrote and the scenes that we wrote. And those scenes delineated, okay, what would happen here? What could take place here? What realistically needs to happen here for a story to continue? The 
the two main characters are Ella and Tara Hines and we portray them as young girls and we portray them as older women. So they, we get to see them age throughout the film. You ain't white, Ella. You ain't never gonna be white. Why not? Look at me. Look at my hair, Tara. Look at my face. Ella is really, Ella is more or less our main focus in this film. She has fair skin and growing up in the late 60s, especially in South Georgia, with segregation with Jim Crow laws with everything being the way that they were the lighter you were the better you were treated her sister Tara is a little older than her about two years I think we had it she is the darker skinned sister so she gets no preferential treatment when she goes into town she's a little more plugged into the actual environment Tara is more aware of her surroundings and what that means for her as a little black girl growing up in the South. So her demeanor is a little more hard, if only to properly balance out Ella's just lightheartedness of everything. You could say she was definitely the more serious sister growing up. She believed in her skin tone she loved her skin tone because that's all she had you know you could even argue that she didn't have to straddle both worlds because she couldn't you know she was black and she looked the part like her her entire family was black so because of that she looked at the world through one as, as one way like i'm treated this way because of the color of my skin and her resolve is as such as you see in the film how long you think it's gonna be before they find out you ain't as white as you pretend to be? Who's to say this ain't who I really am? Why we gotta stay off though, Daddy? We only part color. Some folk don't know how to appreciate special people. And you two are special, my special baby girl. We're really just trying to show people that, you know, the, the color of your skin doesn't, doesn't, doesn't decide your path in life. That uh, colorism, bullying, uh, racism, those are all very much a part of a very nasty and mean time in our history. And how do you grow out of that? I think that's honestly something our country is dealing with right now. It's like we all know so much and we don't know what to do with it. I know that you're white and I'm black and inherently I probably shouldn't like you, but I do. You could even say Ella possibly represents that unknowing confusion in anyone who has to straddle both worlds. There was some viability if you were black, that if you were a little lighter, you would be treated a little better. So even that caused a lot of uh, struggle and turmoil in the African-American community. And Ella, as a young girl, she's really trying to wrestle with this mindset of being from two worlds. I'm black, but I'm white. Well, white people get treated better. Why can't I be white, especially if I'm both of them? She doesn't quite understand what the ramifications are of that. And rightfully so, during that time period, I would ask anyone, how do you properly demonstrate that to a young girl growing up in that time, especially who's light-skinned? We understand now because we have the history to look back on and we understand what that actually meant. But being a parent during the time where you're not even 100 years outside of slavery, still trying to deal with segregation and Jim Crow laws and everything that African Americans had to deal with at that time. How do you properly explain that to your daughter? My mom had an aunt and she was born in 1895. Once she became of age, she decided to go off and pass as white. There have been generations that have suppressed who they are because of this. When I you know, read the script, it was touching because it's still problems that, you know, even though it seems very extreme in the film, like these are still problems that people are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. This kind of story that and the message that it can convey isn't really in a history book. We're trying to just show people this is what could happen. Put yourself in this scenario, be in this weird, mired event for 16 minutes, and then ask yourself, how do you feel? A number of us on the project, not most of us, were mixed. I guess I related in terms of how, how does one self-identify when, when other people have expectations of you based on 
visually how you look. I think that made it more challenging for uh, for one of the characters in the movie because she looked different than her family. That's just been one of the amazing side effects of this film is like people have had a great self-reflection of themselves. Whether it lasts, who knows? But at the same time, we can make you think for a little bit. You sit in that seat, you try to understand what happened, why it happened, why did those whys happen? And then you come back to yourself and hopefully you're a better suited person for it, or at least you look at things differently. You just don't take things at face value anymore. That, that would be my complete, that would be my goal, if anything, for this film, for you to come away and you're able to look at scenarios and look at things a little bit differently and not for what they appear to be, but you actually question it and actually try to dive a little bit deeper into it. I have to say, as a white woman in the South in 2014, it is difficult, but because it's difficult, I think it's important. This is a story that a lot of Americans uh, can relate to. I think this is, you know, a great learning tool um, and will go far. I think it's pretty important to talk about right now, especially after Ferguson and all of the other incidents that have been going on. The cast were amazing. Like, we started the casting process really early on this because everyone that we spoke to, they all said the same thing. Like, you can't make this film without a great cast. And having two sisters that were younger and matching them with two sisters that were older that could still kind of show the range of the life history that the, our characters had, it was huge. <laughs> as far as casting went, casting was very, very important to us from early on, even when we were still writing this, we were like, oh, casting, casting, we gotta make sure this thing looks the part. We needed two sisters, one light skin, one dark, who, and we needed them to match as well with their younger versions of themselves. So our casting process took quite a while. I grew up with a Puerto Rican mother and an African American father, and growing up in a predominantly white community, trying to figure out who I was. And so I had, a, of course, a lot of empathy for understanding the challenges that these two women had. We were crowdfunding and casting at the same time, so I think all in all that took about three months from start to finish, and we had a really great casting director, a phenomenal actress herself named uh, Isabella Way. She's uh, based out of New York, and she hopped on this project very early. A, a lot of the people who were part of the project hopped on early for, uh, out of the strength of the script. They really liked what we were saying, but she came on really guided us through the casting process and you know we kind of leaned on her heavy because we had never been involved so heavily in casting at least from the, the the grassroots part of it starting and not even like not even knowing where to start all right where do we go what do we do it's like okay well let me put out a casting notice she did all of that on a uh, actor's access uh, we talked to a couple of managers and then we just went from there and uh, came away with an amazing cast. I'm, I'm so happy with the people who, uh, who agreed to, to work on this with us. I think my parents found it. <laughs> and I think they thought it was like one of the perfect projects for me because like I look white and my dad's black and my mom's white. I'm this girl that's trying to pass as a white girl and she's just trying to fit in. This is my first um, film project in any capacity. I have this conversation with my friends all the time. There's always this struggle of if you're lighter, you're better. And that still resonates now. The bond of the characters in Across the Tracks really go back to the story, the bigger story itself about what actually is taking place. And that in itself goes back to the script. All the things you don't write in the actual script, the character development stuff, the character bios, the subtext, the history, just developing the world, all of that I feel plays into the bond that our sisters have, our actors have, our characters have with each other because everyone has Everyone has their own story. The one thing I really enjoy about the short film process is like it's just a peek into someone's life. So I really wanted to establish that this story was ongoing. We just happened to pick it up here. It meant a lot to her. Hmm. Like you even know how mama felt. When was the last time you come around again? You are not one to judge me, Ella. She was my mother too. She knew how much I loved her. 
She sure was lucky to have you as a daughter now, wasn't she? I mean, taking time out of your life to take care of her and all? No, wait. That wasn't you, was it? Okay, lady, is it gonna be like this the whole time? Because I don't need this. You don't need this? You come up in Mama's house disrespecting her and sitting up here like you all high-minded? You are the last person to be talking to me about disrespect. Unless you're really paying attention, which I hope it comes across, you understand that there was a point before the story and there's a point that's gonna happen after it and you are just lucky enough to catch the middle ground when uh, Tara has to come home because her mother passed away. So with that being said, I spent a lot of time with the actors uh, via Skype or in person and just telling them, you know, giving them their developmental process that they need as a character. Again, all the things you never see on the script, on the screen, that was enforcing the characters and their motivations. The fact that um, Thursday Farrar, who plays Tara, the older version of Tara, that she was a real estate developer in Atlanta and her job involved, you know, multi-million dollar deals on, on condos and high rises. What type of person is that? Outside of your relationship with your sister, what type of person would that make you? And I gave them enough of, I, I feel like I gave the actors enough of a, a space to develop their own character, to make it themselves. And you know, when they quote unquote presented me like, hey, here's who I think it is, like, yeah, that, that's great. Because as a director, you know, you want your actors to feel comfortable in the character that they're portraying. And everyone, Thursday, Carla, Berkeley, Bryn, all of them, they, they just knocked it out of the park. They really grabbed onto the characters, they developed them, they made it their own, and they were very, very excited to get their, their character onto the screen, which I think you actually need. You need to motivate your actors to want to do the best job that they can do, so they're not feeling like they're just taking orders or following orders, that they themselves can be this character and inhabit this character on the screen, and all we had to do was just roll the cameras. That's ideally what I like for my actors to be able to do, just come in, be themselves in this character, and we capture that moment. Ladies, please. Not in your mama's house, not where she raised y'all. I feel like each character is a little part of myself and Kim. And I feel like what has happened is like, is it, it, each character in a way represents a part of everyone who's kind of watching the film. You have Ella who really just wants to be accepted. You know, not for nothing, you can be as strong-willed as you like, but everyone likes to be liked. Like, I don't, I, don't, I, don't think that's a, I don't think that's an arguable topic. Then you have Tara, uh, the woman who stands in her values, with her morals, and you know, goes through the fire because she understands like this is, this is the way things need to be done. You have their younger selves and their older selves who still reflect like a little bit of that. You can even go back and say you have Walter Lee, the family friend, who's more or less just trying to keep a nice, stable, everybody come together, we're good, right? When they began to do the scene spark, I said, I'd like to lend support in whatever way I can. And she said, well, we got character too, and we know you act, would you like, would you be interested? And I said, yeah, they said, will you read for us? And so I read something for them, and they said, you know what, we think that's Walter Lee. Well, it's about choices, you know? The two girls have a choice. And, and those choices always have consequences. Hats off to the cast and director, for, to Mike, uh, to Kim, for putting together such an amazing cast. From the transition from kids to, to adulthood, it's very believable. Even a part of me, I guess, if you wanted to explore the, the bullies, the kids as well, like part of them even reflect like the nastier side of us, the part of us that, you know, hates, the part of us that is scared of change, the part of us the mob mentality when you see someone else doing something that you don't you kind of agree with like well he's doing it she's doing it maybe it's not so bad if i do it too it's dirty mutts the both of them dirty mutts dirty mutts dirty mutts dirty mutts dirty mutts Again, this is my first first time out of the gate narrative directing, and it's it's been it's a, it's a big learning curve. Uh, yeah, yeah, you learn a lot. Like I, we we've had a lot of good success. I've met a lot of great people, but uh, I think because both my parents and my grandparents on each side are teachers, 
So honestly, anything I do, I, I always have to take like, okay, what can I learn from this? And it's definitely a learning process. Like, what am I gonna do differently next time? How are you gonna approach the festivals next time? Even from a marketing standpoint, like you see just the inner workings of all of this and like what you're trying to get out of the festival circuits. Most people are going, you know, hoping to get enough notoriety to entice distributors. And then they themselves, you know, are able to sell their film, make money off their film, because as a director, as a writer, as a producer, as anyone I would imagine above the line on a film, um, as amazing as that film might be, unless you can really turn a profit on it or understand how to, it's going to be harder and harder to make your craft. Now, again, that doesn't apply to you if your last name is Rockefeller or Scorsese, but for the majority of us to do a service to our craft, you gotta kinda play the market and play the game and see about how to entice the distributors. What are they liking? What don't they like? Uh, can you write something in your wheelhouse that maybe is more in the line of what people want to see? And you get to meet people. You get to actually talk to people, see what they liked about your film, on some occasions what they didn't like about your film, you know, read an audience, see where they gasp, see where they ooh, see where they ah. See other films as well, be influenced by other short films, meet other short film directors, producers, so your network there is growing. Challenge as a producer is to get really talented people who are worth a lot more to come and live with you in, an, in a very small town <laughs> where they can't go home at night and. Um, to pay them almost nothing for it. It's a lot of work, 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 and then creepily looking at people all day on set to make sure that they're not shiny and um, fanning them with fans so their gnats aren't in their face. <laughs> making sure hair is not out of place, making sure it's everything flows as far as wardrobe, makeup, hair just ties it all together. Logistics, uh, making sure that everything is where it needs to be when it needs to be there. Don't be afraid to work with other people. Even people, if you want to be a director and the next guy wants to be a director, you guys need to know each other. You guys need to be friends. There's enough work out there for everyone. Try your best to throw that chip off your shoulder, which happens very early on. Like it, it's a, it, it happened with me. Like you're in your very early, early part of your career. You want to get these jobs. Cool, 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 this is me. I'm trying to get this job. What, there's another director here too? You think you have to shun that person because where the other, he's gonna take your job or she's gonna take your job. That's a natural reflex. I, I think everyone has that, but fight through that the best you can. Don't roll over backwards, but you know, make a point to actually try and be friends with these people you're growing up with because that's what's going to happen. Like, although everyone's going to succeed if you have the right mindset and you'll be happy 10 years later when you're when everyone's knee deep into their career and you just have someone else to rely on, someone else to talk shop about. That level of camaraderie is invaluable because ideally you were in this, uh, you're in this career because you wanna make films or you wanna tell stories. And when you get to a point to where finally your vision is worth enough to support your rent, so you can actually create and not have to worry about if you can keep the lights on, then on top of that, you just have other things that happen and you wanna to talk to someone or you want to be able to have a, a network to where work is thrown your way or vice versa. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten work from other directors or other DPs because they couldn't take the job and vice versa. It's like, I can't take a job. Even like a couple of weeks ago, like I couldn't take a job and I had to just recommend another DP. And he got that job, and what does that do? Is like, well, he got the job. He thanked me. I was like, great, you're gonna do an amazing job. You look good because you recommended a great person, and he now owes you a favor in a weird in a weird way. So, don't be afraid to befriend the people who you think are after your job. Helping whoever I can, running errands, calling extras, contacting cash. You know, everybody has stuff that they might need throughout the day. I get to be in charge of the walkie-talkies. It varies. One moment I might be assisting the director, the next I might be helping with some of the production needs. Wide variety of tasks that I've you know, taken on. My day-to-day my -day workflow was to, um, to back up our, our producer, Kim, Kimberly James. Sometimes her workload would overload and she would have me there to pass stuff on, but Predominantly, I took care of the contracts and, you know, putting out fires. For me, um, I'm in a collaborative role with Mike, the, the director, who's acting kind of director DP. Essentially, um, we're just approaching kind of shot by shot. Um, I get to see what Mike blocks out for directing, and uh, we quickly kind of break down what he has already thought about 
and then you know what we can actually do on the day. Work hard, man. Like keep working. If you think you're done, you're not. Like keep working. Like you're never done. So just continually work hard. Try and better yourself with your craft as well. Learn as much as you can. The College of YouTube is amazing right now. You can learn so much on YouTube and not have to pay a dime. Start work on bigger projects too and lower positions like PA if you can. PA on like multi-million dollar films, PA on te daytime television, PA on all the projects where they have all the toys, all the resources that you can't even comprehend because what that does, it teaches you the proper way production is supposed to be done. It teaches you, it shows you how things are done on a massive level where you have everyone in their place, where you have a line producer and a production supervisor and all, you, you, you need to be on those shoots so you can see how the big boys run it. And then from there, you kind of can adapt and change and understand how you can apply it to your shoot but if you have the rules and regulations and the understanding of how it actually is supposed to go, you're able to kind of bend the rules a little bit in your favor, especially if you're gonna be an indie producer, an indie director, because not to say you won't be doing eight different jobs, but at least you understand what all those jobs maintain. You understand if you're gonna produce, you have to figure out how much insurance you need. Well, what's your budget? Okay, well, how much is the, how much is, the gear we're renting, we need to have insurance for that. Well, where are we going? Like, oh, well, we have miners on set. Miners can only work a certain amount of hours. Like, it, it, those are things that could easily fall through the cracks if you're not actively trying to better yourself, work on larger projects, and also what that'll do, working on larger projects, it'll definitely help kick that, that, uh, that ego thing off your shoulder. You need that stuff, and it's something that you're not really taught in college. You know, not for nothing, not to say that the curriculum was bad, but it's just like, there's not a ethics or a psychology course or an anthropology course on how to act when you get into the real world. You're in this bubble for four years trying to learn how to do the, what you think you know how to do to the best of your ability. Then you get out into the real world and there's no more meal plans, there's no more dorm rooms, and there's no more friends as you can walk over there. And you know just enough to not know nothing. You know just enough to just start right at the very bottom. Yeah, you've been, you've been filming and shooting with your friends for four years. That doesn't matter. You don't. You know, go go go. Get us coffee. Go PA, and maybe we'll invite you back. And you better be thankful for that PA job, because that's how it starts. When I was little, the best thing you could be was a white person. You didn't have a care in the world. You could go anywhere, do anything. No one could stop you. It's just the way it was. 